Uh, big thanks to our next sponsor, uh, Bird and Bird. And Martin, um, welcome. Thank Most you. of you guys might remember him from last time. Um, <laughs> and Martin also has interesting stories to tell about uh, Nikolai. They've been knowing each other for quite some time. So uh, kick it off. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great <laughs> to have this opportunity to introduce uh, some of the old friends. Because uh, this gives you an opportunity where you can say a lot of things and then you can't really respond uh, after later. But um, uh, yeah, we're great. To, we're happy to be sponsors. I mean, uh, as you, it's, a, it's an old joke. It's from last time, actually. But uh, this is the only free lunch you're ever going to get from a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the beer and the, and the pizzas and so on. No, but I, I, I would like to, to, to introduce Nikolai uh, and do it on a somewhat personal note. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was about 14, 15 years ago, I met uh, Nikolai at some uh, sort of similar pre-dot-com uh, bubble burst event like this. Uh, out at Sypion, close to here. Uh, I think it was a first Tuesday event, which also was a kind of investor network at that time. And uh, I met this, uh, this very self-assured, uh, bordering to arrogant, <laughs> <laughs> young guy <laughs> who just started uh, uh, and I'm just but, but at that time actually he was al already at this point uh, somewhat of, of, a, of a veteran uh, uh, an old timer on the Danish internet scene because he had started one of the first uh, I think it was a, a uh, hosting and, and domain name uh, company, domain name registrar administration company that you're probably going to hear more about when, when, uh, during the interview uh, and uh, over the next many years, uh, I've been happy to do a lot of things with you. I mean, the, the, the closest thing was probably <laughs> this miserably failing company called Organic Networks, uh, which uh, was actually a pretty brilliant idea, but failed miserably, uh, partly due to bad timing, but also <laughs> hopeless, hopeless execution, I think. <laughs> 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 you as a CEO. <laughs> at least some of the time. <laughs> some of the time. Uh, no. But, but let me say this. Uh, I mean, uh, now, uh, for fifth, 14 or 15 years uh, later, uh, Nikolai is still very self assured. Uh, he's definitely very arrogant. <laughs> but I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fair to say that uh, uh, for once there is a guy who actually has something to uh, uh, be arrogant about. And uh, Nikolai is, is quite a unique person. Uh, on, uh, he, he probably wouldn't like to be, said, to be mentioned as somebody on the Danish startup scene because he's really more Scandinavian or Northern European or European or global in outlook. But, but here, in, at least in, in this uh, Copenhagen, the Copenhagen, the Danish startup uh, environment, he's quite unique. Uh, he has got something to be arrogant about. Uh, uh, he's, he's quite unique in the sense that I think that uh, for a long period, I kind of really remember how it was before the dot-com bubble burst, but, but at least after, I think he's the only real serial entrepreneur who is involved in the VC uh, business. Uh, you'll hear about what he's doing as a VC, but I mean, he's the, he's the only guy who can actually claim that he's been able to build up some companies and he exited the company, he's been close to actually the things that uh, those that he's investing in now is facing every day. And that's very, really unique, and, and, and Nikolai can, can actually say that he's been doing that for, for a long period before he became a VC, uh, and, and even still, I guess, in, in a certain sense. Uh, he's also uh, unique in the sense that he has a far bigger and stronger uh, international network than everybody else in, in the, our local VC business. I mean, a lot of people know a lot of people uh, within government circles and so on, but this guy actually knows uh, the people that you as entrepreneurs, uh, the investors, the other entrepreneurs, the, the thought leaders and so on, uh, uh, this guy actually knows a lot of them, which is quite unique. And finally, I was also say, I mean, uh, he's uh, one of the few people around in this business who got open source and open business models from the very beginning. Uh, he's been working with it this area uh, with somebody like O'Reilly from for, for far far before everybody anybody even within the VC business decided to invest in it. So uh, he's he's got something to be arrogant about, uh, but but don't be scared because uh, behind this pretty arrogant facade, <laughs> he's actually a nice guy <laughs> and a good friend. So uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Welcome to the stage, Nikolai. <laughs> Thank you. Seat. 
Uh, so it's so cool that you wanted to take the time out of your very busy schedule to come and come and have a small chat with us. Um, so as you already know that we have already been been doing uh, Thomas Mason Mukdal and Morgan Lund, uh, and and you had a very funny tweet the other day where you called uh, called you guys the three Muppets. So I guess now we are we are all the way around. <coughs> but it's more Muppets left. <laughs> no, okay, okay. You gotta give us some clues to those those guys afterwards. But uh, but anyway, um, so uh, so you've been raised in 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 quite a few different places, um, and uh, and uh, for some reason you seem to always be at the right place at the right time, and you've, for instance, invested along some interesting people such such as Eston Kutcher. Um, you're an advisor to Mojang, and I know you know uh, 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 Marcus Peterson or Notch, uh, the guy who built it. Uh, you've worked with O'Reilly, you've been the O'Reilly guy here in Europe, as far as I understand, uh, and you saw the company travel, and now you're so finally a VC at Sunstone. You've been doing a lot of different stuff. But let's, let's, let's start at the beginning. Um, by talking about how you grew up, so so you grew up in a crazy amount of different places. How many actually have you been living in while you were in childhood? Yeah, I was born in India, moved to Denmark, moved to Kenya, moved to Denmark, moved to the U.S., moved to Costa Rica, moved to the U.S., moved to Costa Rica, moved to Denmark, and I've been here for the past 19 years. Yeah. All right, okay, okay. Do you do you think that has uh, taught you anything about uh, life of being an entrepreneur and living all these different places? I mean, you must have had to adapt in quite a, I mean, from a young age already. Yeah, I think I, I mean I think it's definitely taught me a lot of things, and it's also given me um, tons of other challenges on 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 all kinds of other fronts. Um, but I think actually the 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 most important thing is really just you know not always <clears throat> it, it, not always feeling uh, you know. In place, not 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 feeling not feeling comfortable with with what I was doing, uh, or the place I was, and I think you know, lots of people have pointed to that immigrants uh, are you know are overrepresented as as entrepreneurs generally, and I think that when I came back here to Denmark, I very much felt like like an immigrant. Um, I didn't have a I didn't have a network of friends from you know back from uh, um, primary school or even high school or even university. So I moved back here when I was uh, 19, I think. Uh, I'd done two years of college in the U.S. in Boston. Uh, sort of felt uh, felt bad that my, I was asking my parents to pay high tuition, living costs, etc., when I could get everything seemingly for free and, and even with uh, with uh, student grants here. Um, but you know, I didn't have any of these networks. I started out at the University of Copenhagen, hated it, missed campus, didn't like the way they approached economics. Um, um, I went down to uh, Wuk, uh, thought that they were going to do this cross, uh, cross-disciplinary studies, which I was missing from the US. Uh, there was a campus, but the only thing I really learned was that everybody was still, you know, sort of attached to their old networks. The moment that they got off the train on Cyclona, the only thing they thought about was going back to Copenhagen. You know, so <clears throat> campus was dead at 4 p.m. Um, people were would leave class 15 minutes before it was over in order to catch an earlier train and so forth. Uh, so that was a pretty big disappointment um, to me, and and I think that's really what drove me to do my own stuff. Um, and, and I think it was very much the, the start. Um, the great thing then being that I was on SU, and that was that was what financed my first startup. So. <laughs> well, that's nice. Yes. Yeah, so we will we will get to the startup don't worry, but I just want to probe a little bit more into your uh, you know your life before you kind of turn into mm-hmm. startups. So did you have having like peculiar interests or hobbies that you kind of enjoy during the, your uh, pre high school or high school years? Something you remember? Um. I actually financed a good portion of my, my well, this, this was my college time playing backgammon. And, uh, and that was also really my, one of my first real introductions to, to the internet. I, I was sitting there, you know, playing on a BT-100 terminal at Tufts in, uh, in Boston and, you know, playing with, uh, with people all over the world. And that was such a magical uh, thing. Um, and then the rest of the other time I spent hacking my fellow students' uh, mailboxes and, and, and file repositories. But that taught me a lot of other stuff. But that was sort of the... Yeah, so I've, I've always been in, interested in, in like the practical terms of, of technology. Um, but peculiar interests when... I played a lot of soccer, especially in Costa Rica. I was about, you know, 
uh, probably 30, 40 centimeters than everybody else, so I was <laughs> intimidated uh, most of the Ticos uh, when I played. Um, but uh, yeah, a bit of surfing. I mean, it was great being a being the the white boy in in Costa Rica and and, and enjoying high school there. Yeah, I could imagine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, also moving on to all these different places. I mean, I guess I must have taught you from a quite early age. I mean, how to build a network. I mean, how to. Sure. I mean, how to get in the network quickly. I mean, I mean, I remember when I started in the startup scene. I mean, that was a tough part to know the right to know the right people. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think it taught me both that, and it also you know taught me which I think is a has been a sound principle for survival, but not always like on the emotional side. It taught me how to cut things off after you know every four years, get done, move on. Um, and you know, I think actually, I think probably my toughest move was probably um, going back from Kenya to Denmark in beginning of fifth grade. Um, and you know, I think we all, if we all try to remember, at least the guys in here remember back to fifth grade. It was it was a tough time, and you really have to fight. You really had to fight your way in, and and um, I made. I made a lot of trouble uh, because I was the only one to get respect. And the school psychiatrist, he um, he thought I was bored, um, and that was why I was making trouble. Uh, that I was bored, that it was it wasn't challenging enough for me, and it might have been a small truth. So they moved me up into sixth grade, meaning that not only was I the new guy, I was also a year younger than everybody. So I had to make twice as much trouble uh, to really gain respect, and, and 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 those were definitely some some tough years. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, as we mentioned, that you started your first startup on this. You uh, so so was that how you got into startups by being bored at work or? or? Uh, yeah, I think I, I I definitely think so. I mean, I was asked by an old college uh, friend from Tufts to help out on some something called domain names in in uh, in Scandinavia they had they were like New York based they had a couple they had some clients that needed uh, needed assistance in, in like Scandinavia sure I can help and 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 then I quickly saw how stupidly they were doing things um, I ran into and ran into some guys from uh, from Sweden and we decided to sit down and and, uh, and build this in a much better way so yeah. mm -hmm. so I think it's it, it, that was that was really a oh, cool and that was what be became speed names, right? That was what became speed names because I mean, so when I was working with this uh, company, uh, <coughs> the, names, the, the way they were handling the main, I mean, so this was ninety, early ninety eight, probably something like that. Uh, the way they were handling the main name registrations was, you know, it was binders, it was faxes, it was uh, phone calls. Uh, customers would have to call in to have DNS changes made and so forth and. And I actually really didn't enjoy, uh, you know, talking to customers. Um, and I remember we quickly helped them get some pretty big clients, which I had to 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 handle: Carlsberg, Kodoplast, uh, Quanfos, Danfoss, uh, Lego. Um, and I just, you know, I hated because I, you know, I also ended up fucking up because I didn't have my stuff in order and like all these fucking binders and stuff like that. And and and. Um, and so, and, and I really wanted to do this much, much better. It was also, it was at, at that point, really the, 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 the very core of it was it was impossible to do a, a search for domain names back then. You know, so if you wanted uh, Dare to Mansion, uh, you, could, you could get it here in Denmark, you, for going to Danish ISP, you could get .dk and comnet .org. If you wanted to search in German, get a German domain name or even search whether it was available in, in Germany, you had to, to contact an ISP down there. Same in France, same in Japan, and so forth. And what we basically did was consolidate and make that search easy. And we actually launched just with the search, and it became super popular. And then we latched on top of the the actual registration, uh, being able to automatically change your DNS settings. You know, just the very simple stuff. Um, um, and 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 that was yeah. I, we 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 hit a chord, and we hit a time when everybody thought that they had to register thousands of domain names, so it was a, it was a very good business. Uh, yes. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm a technology guy, and I can't really imagine anything more boring to do domain names, I guess, yeah, now, but I mean, it was, it was a very different mm. time back then. I mean, it was a lot of opportunity to, I mean, it seems obvious today that 
there's so many different providers of that service you can choose sure. from today. So I mean, but back then you were the only. Back then we were. I mean, we were really the only ones, um, and which was you know you look back what 15 years that we launched in April of '99. Uh, you know, there was just all of the key components of the infrastructure of the web were you know still in the very early days. You know, we 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 still only had Netscape. Um, you know, some people were still using Mosaic. Actually, Internet Explorer had been launched, but was a piece of shit. Um, and and it was it, it was still the early formative years, right? You couldn't even you couldn't even use. It was still at that point when we launched. It was um, um, it was uh, it was not <coughs> legal to use that code on the web. Um, so we actually launched without having credit card clearance. <laughs> and we even accepted orders with credit card with having, without having credit card clearance on, on the back. Uh, and we did a basic cash check of, well, this actually, this could be a legal credit card, uh, but we don't really know. And then four and a half, five months <coughs> later, we, we finally got our processing agreement with WorldPay, which was um, a startup out of, uh, out, of, uh, out of Scotland, which ultimately was owned by Royal Bank of Scotland. And then we started processing all the... the uh, uh, the cards, and we cleared about 91%, but I mean, our margins were so ridiculous that they, we could have cleared 30% and still not lost money, so. So it was, actually, I think it was, that was probably my, um, that was my lesson in lead, uh, <laughs> which was just, you know, just to, to do it, so. Okay. So, so was that why you got into tech, or any particular reason why you, why you chose tech, I mean? I, I think, yeah, so I mean, I studied, I guess what's part of the story was that I studied, um, I studied economics and history. Mm -hmm. um, and what really interested me was history. Uh, I think I studied economics partially because I enjoyed what my, so my dad worked with foreign aid. Um, uh, in Kenya, he was, uh, he was head of uh, Danida for East Africa, which is the uh, Danish foreign aid department. And I did a lot of traveling with him. I probably traveled about a week, a month uh, with him, you know, going out to see wild projects out in the bush, um, drive Range Rovers, fly small propeller planes over, uh, over, the, over Masai Mara and so forth. And, and so I was really enticed by, by that. Um, and when, but when I came to, to, to Tufts, the only thing which was really in my head was, you know, figuring out how this internet thing worked right and you know there was no when I started I clearly remember a day in October when when first time I used the mosaic browser that was just like whoa until then we'd been using you know uh, term I ordered a I remember ordering a CD you know logging with, with terminal uh, we had gopher which was like the University of Minnesota's like webish uh, thing but then was this thing called mosaic came up in at the uh, in, in, it probably came up a couple of months earlier, but in the fall of '93, <coughs> I used it for the first time, and it was just amazing. There were photos, and it took me—I think it took me two months to figure out that there was something called bookmarks. I had to remember all my click paths, <laughs> like how I got to different website. I clicked on this, and I clicked on that, and like—and then if somebody changed the layout of their page, I was lost, gone. I didn't know how to get back to that page, right? But it was just. You know, very very basic stuff, but it just it just fascinated me, and and I, I really kept up on on that for uh, for a while. Um, okay. Um, okay. So so we did speed names, and which one came after that? Was that organic? Or that was organic. That worked organic, with yeah. uh, <laughs> Martin uh, and <laughs> Thomas Mikta, who you had here one or two times ago. Uh, it was a uh, it was a fascination with Wi-Fi. It was a little bit the same thing, right? You know, we have this fascinating piece of technology. I think most importantly was that you know, it sort of uh, took us away from you know sitting like this and working towards the rest of the crowd, you know, or at home with the family to sitting at least like this and being able to look over the you know the edge of the laptop. And it was it really fascinated us and and. Um, so we started, uh, we started looking at, you know, playing, we, we didn't really know what we wanted to do, ex except it was Wi-Fi. Uh, we could see the fact that, uh, that, that Wi-Fi was also driving ADSL sales for the ISPs, and we thought it was, uh, especially with uh, Thomas's altruistic uh, uh, nature, um, we really wanted to go into the, to the ability to sort of not just do the ISPs last mile, but you know, an additional 30 meters. 
Um, so we, we hacked the, uh, the Linksys access point. Our, um, our developer was uh, uh, set up a project called OpenWRT. Um, uh, we had help from the guys who did the first commercial 802.11, first Wi-Fi chips, uh, in essentially like really taking stuff to stuff apart. And uh, we created what was essentially a, f a phone, um, uh, which was the ability for, you know, if there was a TDC subscriber over here and I was a TDC subscriber, I could automatically log onto the, onto the net. Yeah. We had lots of legal resistance, which this guy wasn't able to, like, sort of like, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> unfold. And, and, uh, and, and I think, but I think worst of all was the fact that we, we didn't go out and challenge the ISPs. We tried working with them. And they were, you know, so every time we went to an ISP, they said, I, uh, you know, and, and we said we have this Wi-Fi thing, and most of, at that point already, so this was 2003, and we were started selling and marketing in 2004. At that point, um, most of the ISPs have been been bought by the telcos, and um, and 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 so the tel every time we came and said Wi-Fi, they said, oh, we have this hotspot business, right? Which they were starting to set up at the cafes and other stuff, and it was, and they all hated it because they were losing money on it. They were afraid it was going to cannibalize data traffic and so forth. And we said, no, 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 we want to talk with your residential unit, and it just, it just didn't come to anything. Um, we had a on the record uh, horrible investor, uh, investor. Um, who at the point when uh, when Thomas Martin and I said that look we're we're willing to to finance the the uh, the project for we ran out of money after two years and that suddenly means that everybody's interested in it and all of the ISPs who who had been uh, uh, who had been um, uh, saying no to us uh, they started calling because they got afraid of him um, Google and Skype invested uh, and Sequoia I think. Uh, Yahoo called, and uh, a, a guy called Simon Levine, who's who uh, has recently been at Excel, he called and wanted to buy the company. And Simon, we closed down the company. <laughs> There's an open source project. Go use that, right? Um, um, and actually, there's an interesting side story with Skype. Uh, I don't remember if you remember that we were sitting in. I think in, I actually told you that when Morton was introduced. Okay. <laughs> but you, so, you probably have the true version. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think we all have selective memory, right? But um, but uh, we were sitting at, in the, in the basement uh, pub of Martin's uh, house in Kumhau with with uh, with Morton and Janus Fleece. and uh, back then Skype was called Skyper, um, and the real reason why there was a there was a voice over IP. Um, client, what we today know as Skype, was because it was a Trojan horse to get onto your PC and share your DSL connection from there. <laughs> and obviously they never got to step number two because step number one was such a success. But I didn't believe that. It was like, guys, you, that's never going to work. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's the reason why we didn't sort of join forces. Um, uh, because that was clearly, the, I think, the intention with the, uh, with the meeting. So, uh, so that was not always in the right place at the right time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, 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 good, good. Uh, so, so another one of your, your startups that I just briefly want to touch upon before we move to something else uh, is uh, Polar Rose. So, mm -hmm. so, so what was Polar Rose all about? So Polar Rose was about me meeting a brilliant computer vision, so you know, face recognition, image recognition, scientist out of University of Lund called Jan Erik Solum. And uh, he had uh, construed a method to essentially get a, a 3D model out of a single 2D photo, meaning that he could radically improve uh, a face recognition. This was what, uh, two, early 2006. Um, and he was going to use it for security purposes. And then I was. I thought it was so boring, and, uh, and I also had ethical issues with it. But what I found really interesting was if we applied this to a much wider use case of you know, search for images, which essentially hadn't improved since the early days of the web. So I did an initial, um, uh, he actually had a company set up, so he is the true founder of, of what was back then. I couldn't remember, I can never remember the, the, the name. It was called Ground Truth Vision, the, uh, the name of the company. And I rebranded it to Polar Rose, um, um, which I, I knew that he would accept because it's actually a mathematical um, uh, algorithm. Um, 
Uh, he was a he was a physicist, is a physicist of training, and yeah, we we did decently well um, on a couple of consumer products, but we couldn't figure out how to make money. Uh, uh, image search, uh, unlike web search, was not easily monetizable, and um, um, I think many people know Gartner's um, hype curve. You know. It's about writing it up or it's about writing it very long. And we were fortunate enough that there was another height, and there was another curve that we could ride, which was mobile. Um, so we very quickly retrofitted to mobile, and uh, people started contacting us about licensing this. We did a project together with uh, TAT in, uh, in, uh, in Malmö, um, Hampus Jakobsen, uh, who some of you might know. And that got a lot of attention, and we got some people who started approaching us uh, for licensees. And one of these potential licensees wanted exclusivity, and the easy way to get exclusivity is, of course, um, buying a company. Mm -hmm. So that ended in 2010, which was when I joined Sunstone. All right, great. Okay, cool. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about your your startup working. Um, uh, I think I read on your blog that you had something called wheat paste. Uh, it uh, you would describe it as a friend, a group of friends that that just did random or not probably not random, but web web concept. I sure. mean, it seems very much in. I mean, you seem to see a lot of these types of constructions. I mean, I think I just read about Kevin Rose who skipped, uh, who, who jumped out of Google Ventures to go join a startup um, called North, which was which is supposed to do app products, four products also. Mm. Uh, so is this the same type of thing, or or how do you think? I mean, it? actually, back then it was really just fun. Okay. It was like it was together with. Um, with two guys from the community who were colleagues of mine at Speed Names, my first startup, um, Molden Used, who now works at Google, um, and Klaus Dagel, uh, who's worked in a couple of different startups here and now runs uh, like a, uh, a data insight consultancy um, uh, here in, uh, in Copenhagen. And we just basically, we, we Morton's a fantastically creative UX guy. Uh, I've always been interested in like trying to take technology and make it into a product, and I felt that's been my strong point. So it was everything from, from uh, you know, we, we were, um, one of the first concepts we did was, uh, was take, um, uh, um, this was back when blogs started becoming big, so, oh, Three or four or something like that, uh, and 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 Technorati, the blog search engine, came about. And so what we did was that we just mined Technorati for the links that included Google Maps. Google Maps had just come out, and what we just did, what we then did was uh, um, the first Google Map API, uh, API hacks were out there. So we started plotting blog posts back on a map. So, okay, if I open the map and I look at Copenhagen, what are the blog posts that have a geotag in them? So it's just stuff like that. Another thing we did was, um, what, was what became Imity. Uh, we, um, uh, Imity was my third startup, uh, which we merged into uh, um, Tommy Atlas uh, Soup, and which was then sold to Vodafone. And what we did was, we didn't really care where, this was, it was location-based social networking. This was pre-iPhone, pre-GPS on the phones, and what we really just thought was interesting was that who's around you. So we were using Bluetooth to basically just pull in the room, and, and it would then, the app would then tell me that, that the, the two of us were actually in location X uh, three months ago, or, and, and we even, we did the first, we actually did the first external um, uh, API integration that LinkedIn ever did, which was that it would buzz your phone when somebody you knew was near you, or uh, somebody's blog who you were reading and stuff like that. It was just it was it was it was a lot of truth and beauty, um, uh, but it, but the execution was super difficult. You know, it was like Nokia phones, which were even just like three stacks. You know, Symbian three, Symbian two, JTOME, Ericsson phones. Uh, I mean, that, that that was like the those were the dominating back then. Bluetooth was a, a a battery drain, et cetera, et cetera. But like the concept of it was was uh, was great. And then the last thing we did was um, something called Spotify DJ, which is still for me like one of my most powerful uh, um, internet experiences. Which was sort of like when you first time open Napster, and I was able to uh, look into Las Buas, a folder of music, other people's folder of music. 
um, and Spotify DJ was something where Klaus on top of Spotify hacked so that he could actually play Spotify for me while I was sitting in my summer house in, 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 in Skåne. And that was extremely powerful. Like somebody else was playing music for me. I was sitting there and I, I felt I had to, when I, when I left, I felt I had to say goodbye to him and all these kind of things. It was, so this was like, uh, yeah, this was 2007 when, when it was Spotify was still in, in, in closed beta, I think. But it's, it's stuff like that, and it's it's the truth and beauty uh, kind of stuff, which which has always inspired me. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so but I wonder where you picked up that piece of information. Is that I think it's on your new one, uh, DC build blog. I think it was there. Right? Is that still remember. alive? Yeah, 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 wow. yeah, 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 yeah. We we really try yeah. to dig deep, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of the other things we actually can read in this blog is about when you switch from going to Polar Rose to join Sunstone. We have a very beautiful phrase sentence where you write, "I joined the dark side to shine a light on it." Uh, why? why? I assume that the dark side in this case is the VCs. I mean, I always have some ideas why I think that is, but do you want to talk about why you thought VCs are the dark side? Or maybe, it's, I don't know. Well, I mean, it was, uh, I think I was partially persona non grata with uh, certain people for a while uh, after I did that switch. Um, people <laughs> felt deceived and I didn't, I wasn't true to my calling and so forth. Um, why did I do that switch? Um, I think that, that you know I, I, I think I think that you know it, it can be it can obviously be extremely demanding to to run a, uh, a startup um, you have investors on top of you you have employees on the bottom and like you constantly have this this feeling that that um, um, that another 20 minutes is is, uh, is is going to mean everything and the Netflix CEO once told me was that you know um, you never you never take your startup for given, but you often take your family for given, and that became a, that 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 was that that had become super clear uh, to me at that point, um, and I and I think the so for me it was it was also investing um, had been something which I had done on the side sort of to sort of like. You know, relieve, relieve a bit of steam once in a while from like the daily operations, and I really enjoyed it. And apparently, people uh, enjoyed me as well. So I thought that, um, and 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 a couple of different funds have been pinging me. I wasn't ready to move out to Copenhagen. Uh, I really liked the Sunstone uh, team. I I had uh, they'd invested in two of my angel investments. I was on a board of a third of them, and. And, and one of the partners had been on the board of my first company uh, uh, back in the day. So for me, it was a, it was a very natural choice. Um, and, uh, but, but God, there was a lot to learn from, from that switch. Um, so, so why is it the dark side? Um, I, mean, I mean, we VCs are features, right? You know, we're not the ones who build the company. We can't fix the team if it's wrong. Uh, we can tell you all kinds of stuff about that we're gonna, you know, that that uh, that uh, that we're there for the entrepreneur and, and stuff like that. But but and which is absolutely fucking true. But on the other hand, we need to we have a business to run. We need to make our money. We need to return the money to our investors. Otherwise, we don't get more money. We have to put in a good portion of our own money in there too, uh, along it. And and that means that you know. Um, uh, you're not always aligned with the uh, with the entrepreneurs, uh, at least over over the long run. So so and 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 I think the dark side is, has obviously been the joke for for many people. But it's and it's it certainly is a very different role and much more of a feature than than one going out there and, and creating. It. So okay, we we have actually talked talk a bit of Thomas Mason Mukdale uh, this morning to try to dig up some additional dirt. And, uh, and, it's a good place to dig up dirt. <laughs> uh, one very interesting thing that he, he, he told us was that uh, something about that you had an opportunity at least to create a white, create, uh, sorry, white combinator in, uh, in Europe at that time. Uh, is that true? And, and what's the story then? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you can create a white combinator in Europe. I think that's the story, um, but I think the um, 
I, I, I definitely, you know, I don't think it would have become a white combinator. I think that's the first thing. But I, I think the second thing is, is um, I'm, I'm a true believer in early stage, and I'm doing earlier and earlier stage investing, especially in certain sectors like gaming. Um, but I'm not a big uh, believer in the accelerator uh, model. I think one of the things that all of the European accelerators get wrong is the use of mentors. Um, I had a great fourth grade teacher, Mr. Logan, in Kenya. Uh, he, was a, he, was, he was probably the best teacher I've, I've ever had. And, and I, I met him you know, uh, out of chance in, in Boston when I was there in college. And I asked him, you know, Mr. Logan, uh, I still didn't know his first name. <laughs> why were you the best teacher I ever had? And he sort of laughs at me and he, he looks at me and he says that, that his principle was to make the students teach each other. And um, I met Paul Graham at um, 2005, 2000, probably two, the very fir his very first batch of, of YC at food camp, O'Reilly's food camp in, in Sevastopol in Northern California. And he said just about the same thing to me, that for him it was about having the students teach each other, so the, 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 um, the, the startups. And I think that's what he's gotten right and what basically everybody else has gotten wrong. The, the accelerators uh, borrow feathers, they try to get people like me to speak with startups that we're not interested in or don't know jack about. And, 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 uh, and we typically feel a, a need to open our mouth, which is probably more destructive to the startup than it's helpful. Um, and and I, think it's, I think it's the wrong way to do it. Okay. So. I mean, yeah, but that's an honest answer. <laughs> and, then I think, and then I think that the, on, on sort of like the YC in Europe, I think YC has become the portal, the gateway to Silicon Valley, right? You know, you pay a tax and, <laughs> and then you get, you know, you get great funding. And, and I think they're in a unique, they've come into a unique situation to do that based on, on previous results. But it's also because it's a gateway to something. Like, I love Copenhagen, but it's, but a gateway to Co Copenhagen on the tech scene is not valuable. Um, it's valuable if you're, if you're, if you're an aspiring chef and, and, and want to go create uh, something amazing there, but not, but not on the technology side. So that's, kind of, that's why I declined, and I think most of all, I felt the need to, that I actually wanted to work more dedicated with, uh, with the startups, and I wanted, to be, I wanted the ability to follow up on the investments, and not just push in a little bit of money and then uh, push them afloat, so. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, we 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 quite a quite a few here in the, in the Copenhagen startup ecosystem, as I guess you call them, that you know trying to fight to you know build it all together. Mm -hmm. Kind of simplify with this savage uh, for the win thing. I mean, how, how do you your role and Sunstone's role in all of this? Big, I mean, obviously you invest, I understand that, but I mean, can you contribute in some other ways or how do you see? It? So I mean, I I think for me that the greatest thing is that, that you know. Um, if we old guys are no longer the ones driving it, right? And we shouldn't be, uh, because then the scene wouldn't be evolving. I think it's amazing what's happening right now. Uh, there's lots of positive energy. Um, uh, we're getting away from the... You know, when I did my first startup, for the first... I was still enrolled at Oak, and I still had some friends there. It took, you know, the first two years, I, I told people I was working at this startup. I didn't tell them it was my startup. Yente, uh, right? You know, there was no. I didn't. I wasn't going to get any benefit from it. But it also meant that you know, that that, that they you know they didn't have any interest in, in in the startup community. And and I think while it hasn't changed as radically as it has, for example, in Stockholm, where you know if you poll the if you if you poll the, um, the Stockholm School of Economics students of you know where is their number one choice for workplace, they they say Spotify, right? You poll the the CBS students, and it's still Mask and Danske Bank, and 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 I think I so I still think we have a, a, a ways to go, and we need some light ships, and 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 I think so. Where where we have a role as investors is to avoid the previous knee jerk reaction of flipping stuff to the U.S. That to me, um, maybe I've become old and sentimental and patriotic. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, or I find it just find it a responsibility that we, we need to to build some of, of these companies here. And for me, the, the, the most important thing that Spotify brings to, uh, to Stockholm is actually not the fact that people look at Daniel and say, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. It's the fact that you, you're suddenly creating this, this um, group of lieutenants, this layer of lieutenants who've been there, who've, who, who, who've gone through it, and who, some of them go out and create their own startups, and actually I think that's even not that important. But, but, but I know exactly where to go recruit a marketing, a, a VP marketing in Stockholm. I don't know that for a tech startup. I don't know that here in Copenhagen. So I think we as, as investors have a huge responsibility at growing that here, right? You know, so it doesn't just become the technical uh, and slash product operations. Um, and I think, you know, I think that we have plenty of those examples, right? You know, there's no, you know, I know, I know Mikkel and Alexander keep on talking about why they needed to be in the valley and all kinds of stuff. And, and I, it might have taken them two years longer, they could have, but they could have built Sendesk here. Um, Unity uh, with, uh, with David Helgeson, he, he could have built, he could have stayed here and built Unity. Um, it's a little bit more, more, more difficult, right? But, but, you know, as long as your initial customers are global or anywhere, I mean, I don't think, I don't think, Sendesk got, gets any advantage of like I don't think there are more Sendesk customers in the valley than there are in 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 like uh, East Coast uh, U.S. So so his so Mickelson's Alexander's uh, access to, to was mostly to talent right, and that's the thing which would have taken longer here but could certainly still have, have happened. So so that's the that's sort of like the um, that's the vow I would like Danish startups to make that they will you know. I'm bitching it. There's no fucking reason why Heine should be in SF building Bibino there, other than the fact that he wants, to, he, he per, has, has a personal ambition about it. And I will call him out on it, uh, like I'm doing now, and I will call him out on it over and over. And, and, and I do not believe his, uh, his claims when, uh, when, uh, that he has to be there. Okay. So. But why, so the why, why are we, why is Vivino then moving to San Francisco? Is it only because of the money, you think, or...? or? Well, of course he has easier access to talent. On the, like, he doesn't... I mean, it would be... It would take him half a year, maybe a year, to recruit a marketing manager and, uh, or VP marketing, an experienced VP marketing, and bring him or her to uh, Copenhagen. But, and, and that's, those are some of the reasons. And, and his follow-on funding... But, I mean, clearly, Heine showed that he could... He could get the funding, right? His first funding came from from uh, Janus Fleece. Uh, um, then, uh, then I didn't want to fund him for the next round, so I gave him tips on how he wouldn't get totally screwed by Seed, um, and hopefully uh, his lawyer helped him as well. Um, and then he went and got money from Bollington, right? You know, so sure, and we can see how many, uh, how many, uh, um, how many. F Copenhagen companies that have been funded by, you, you know, the U.S. investors and London investors have a have an international perspective, right? And and the Nordics we have, like right now we have lots of sun and lots of love on us. So, okay, yeah. cool. So 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 do you think Samsung can do anything to uh, to to get Bivino back here? Or? No, oh. that's a lost <laughs> battle. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, well, hypothetical question. I mean, with, with anybody. Yeah, yeah but I, for, for me, it's more important that the next company doesn't do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And right. and and I will be super outspoken, and, and you know, I and I think it. I think there are, I think there are lots of great and lots of uh, important upcoming companies that that need to stay here in in, uh, in Copenhagen, and and if, and I hope we can do something about that. So, um, yeah. All right. All right. What's what's. Uh, What's Sunstone's end game? I mean, uh, do you have any like big vision that you want to achieve? Or, I mean, how 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 do you see that? Well, I mean, the the the, the thing, and I think that the the transformation. I mean, we 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 changed our team quite a lot since I came on board. Um, I think you know we're we're a, we're a tight investment uh, team. We're four part we're four investment partners. Four partners that do new investments. Um, Jimmy and Christian who were there previously um, 
and then I came on board, and then Max Niederhofer uh, came on board uh, from the, the, who we brought over from Excel. And um, I mean, we, we certainly have the ambition of being the preferred go-to uh, early stage investor for Europe. So, okay. Uh, okay, so we got around quite a few different topics, I guess. One, one thing, uh, so you're still doing a lot of different things. I mean, you've been doing, doing, uh, doing, doing startups mostly in, 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 in tech, of course, and now you're, you're, you're VC. So what is it actually that, that drives you? I mean, what, what are you, yeah, what are you driven by? I think that, you know, for me it's still, and I mean, the, the, this does cause, you know, we're not always in agreement within the partnership about investments and type of people to invest in and so forth. And, and I still think I have a, a very deep love um, for, the, um, for the technologist and, and for the technologist who takes and, and, and you know, extracts technology into a product. Um, I think this is, you know, I'm focusing on two domains right now. One is open source developer software, so, you know, that would typically be databases. I have two investments in, in that area. Neo4j, open source graph database, and Crate, which is a, a data store built on top of uh, Elasticsearch. Um, I have an unannounced open source storage company, and I think that's it in open source. And then, and then it, the, on the other on the flip side is gaming. Um, and these entrepreneurs often, typically, and tend to be very like the. Uh, the technology founders of, of open source uh, companies, um, and yeah, I th I think that's that's certainly my uh, area of love. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, I actually f uh, <coughs> forgot to talk about one thing I want to talk about before we move into my final question, and then we give it up to the floor. Uh, that's this uh, uncanny ability you seem to have to be at a very good place at a perfect time. Uh, for instance, I remember re writing on reading on your blog as well that you. Uh, met Nicholas Nicopanda, the founder of uh, MIT Media Lab, in an elevator holding a, a one laptop per child, uh, a laptop in his hand, a prototype and model. I mean, how, how do you really put yourself into those situations where you just meet everybody? Or, is that a networking talent? Or? Well, I mean, that, that might be part of like, my, my childhood thing of like, being able to accommodate uh, New situations very easily. I think I think the I think the like one of the things I used to speak a lot about was the the fact that many many Danish and European entrepreneurs just didn't just do stuff right. You know, um, uh, I got to know uh, Esther Dyson, and she started inviting me to uh, come to PC Forum, which was like her big conference back in the early 2000s around dot com and, and a little bit a little bit further there and that's where I met other people um, and then uh, Thomas McDowell and I started inviting these people to come to reboot and you know one thing takes the other takes the next uh, I think it's about being uh, you know also being generous and and uh, um, uh, um, and, and, and loyal um, you know right now I'm I'm uh, while it's, my, while it's maybe not that visible, I, I'm a big lover of food, and um, the, the the Danish culinary um, scene has has obviously evolved a lot over over the past couple of years. So um, this coming weekend, uh, René Lecep, he has a one of his other projects is called the Mad Symposium, where he brings in the top 600 chefs, food scientists, farmers, foragers, you know, for like a two-day TED-style event. And, you know, uh, making certain that he can, uh, he can put that on with, you know, with the type of budgets that we know that the, 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 that the hospitality business has is, is you know, uh, is, is something which is fun and <coughs> rewarding and, and playful and it's very much the same type of attitude as here in the, in the tech community. So I think it's, I think that's what it's um, uh, what it's about, and and I, I think it's unfortunate that Negro Ponte didn't really get the the old PC thing. It was a, it was a beautiful little thing, and it was <laughs> the only time I actually ever played with one. Mm -hmm. So in the elevator. So. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Nikolai. Uh, so you so you turn forty in September next year, as far as I know, right? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, we have to talk about it, I guess. And uh, and I think it was Sebastian who who told me that there's a classic Silicon Valley statistic that says that that when you enter the 40s, you're going to do your most exciting stuff. Uh, so what's what? So what are you going to do in the next 10 years? Wow. Um, I mean, I think I think the you know being the feature with uh, with the. Uh, for, for a bunch of startups is uh, I think is is actually an important thing um, um, in the next 10 years my so I, I have three kids my oldest is 14 my youngest is eight um, so in 10 years uh, he'll be 18 so we don't know whatever uh, ever happens there um, and I think the the uh, you know being able to continue to create stuff in whether it's going to be the technology domain or something else I have I have no clue like uh, uh, I go hiking in the Alps and I want to become a mountain farmer right you know it's it's uh, actually that's that's a little anecdote on on I was you know I was essentially like uh, I was flipping back and forth between studying forestry management and economics and I don't know where forestry management would have taken me but I think it's less likely to have taken me into into the tech scene. So maybe I will actually finally go back to school, get an education. Uh, I never finished my economics education. Uh, maybe I'll go forestry management, and, and you can come look me up in the woods. <laughs> That's a really cool, cool ending. So uh, with that, I want to open it to the floor. If we have one or two questions from the floor, hmm? do we have a mic? We can move around. We don't, right? No. Okay. Good. Yeah, so there was a question about what Sunstone and the other venture firms or the venture capital firms can do for the CPAs, FTW movement and the startup scene in general. But what can the big companies do? Like Google is sponsoring Startup Grind and Microsoft Ventures is out there. And I saw that Google Ventures actually just started a fund in Europe for $100 million, I think. So there are these big players such as Google, Microsoft, and many others that are in there, and they have an interest, right? Mm. Are they helping, or are they just like where, where do you see these? Uh, I mean, I think the most important thing about Microsoft is the fact, and and Apple as well, is the fact that they have so much money sitting in foreign funds that they cannot bring back into the U.S. because they get heavily taxed, and they have to spend <laughs> some of that money. Uh, acquiring companies, yeah. um, I, I I really think that 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 is their continued um, core responsibility to be at that end of the of the ecosystem. And I mean that's one of the reasons why um, I think we in I mean we don't have I'm sorry to say we don't have a full ecosystem in Europe and. Um, you know, sort of like um, there's a common friend of, of uh, Martin and, and I, as Tonerton says that you know, one person's shit is the other person's food, right? You know, we have to have this circle going, and the problem is that too often, you know, we don't have the bigger fish eating the smaller fish here in Europe. Um, they 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 don't really exist here yet. We'll hopefully have companies like Spotify. We have companies like King now who are starting to acquire. A Supercell will be acquiring, as will probably Rovio if they don't get acquired by Disney before then. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the that's what's really needed for the for the ecosystem to to be here, um, because you know the the acquisition of Polar Rose meant that that a full team was yanked up and and pulled to. Mm -hmm. Cupertino, right? You know, and, and I think that's that, that's that is the unfortunate side of it, and that means that the that the that, that the ecosystem stops at some point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So you being so pro Denmark and pro Copenhagen, pro Europe. You would never have heard me say that as an entrepreneur, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting. Yeah. So. Okay. But so, me, yeah. so no, I'm just saying that you being so pro Copenhagen and pro Europe, do you see it as a Threat or something bad that there are so many American companies coming here. Oh no no no! I, I think that they you know I think the great thing is like I mean Skype is still a London company right and um, uh, you know Yanus fought so hard to keep it independent. Uh, it was just very difficult at that type of, of money that Microsoft was was paying. But that's certainly another company which could have played a huge role in uh, in in Europe. Um, 
and 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 I think I think the I think it's you, you know it took 30 years to build the startup slash venture venture community in, in well in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. of which venture was a small component, of which the universities were a component, of which mm -hmm. uh, um, 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 the, the 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 entire I, I think the entire region was a was a large component, and and it's going to take the same for for Europe, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but we have been lacking we have been lacking these big fish who will, you know, gulp some of the smaller and then they'll 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 shit and that will be the you know the food for somebody else to to start up mm -hmm. another um, amoeba amoeba somewhere in the in the system that can live off that for a while. I mean, I think that you know you can, you can. I think you can hire better engineers at a lower price here in Europe. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, um, if you like food, there's a good reason to be here. Uh, no, I, I, I think I think the I think the you know we 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 have a market which is becoming more and more coherent here in Europe. You know, uh, thanks maybe not so much to the EU, but as to you know low cost airlines popping up. Um, um, I think the EU's biggest contribution to the startup community in like of its existence is probably uh, removing roaming fees, um, and 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 it's I, I think I think the you know I think we have extreme talent here on the engineering and product side, which is hopefully one of the reasons you're 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 here. But on the commercial side, we're still lacking. Uh, we're still lacking real talent, and 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 of course, and that's why you know. I don't blame Heine. I'm going to call him out, but I'm not going to blame him because the thing is, when you're an entrepreneur, you think about one thing. That's the success of your startup. If you can get better people in, in SF around, around the commercial side, of course you're going to go there. You don't have that year, and, and I think that's where, where we as investors who, you know, after all, have like a 10 or 15 year perspective and not a, you know, uh, from table to mouth uh, type of of, uh, of, of perspective, um, so I, I think it's 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 a little bit you know playing a hoot uh, has a false tone when I say that Copenhagen is a better place to build a startup, but I think we do have uh, lots of talent here. I think actually we can take one or two questions more. Um, we're good on time. <coughs> Um, in recent years, uh, there's been a development, or maybe before, a few years ago, there was a uh, development in VC that they were moving upstream, uh, investing into later stage companies. But now you're saying you're moving downstream again and start to invest in seed stage. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because you touched it briefly. Well, I mean, I think on, on, on gaming, it's very easy to explain, right? You know. Um, I remember first time I met Marcus in, in Stockholm, you know, uh, it was a personally owned company. This was the summer of, early summer of 2010, right? Mar Marcus Pearson Notch, who did Minecraft. Uh, you know, start of 2000, and, uh, summer of 2010, um, two, he was still, he still had a personally owned company. He'd been doing this project on the side uh, while working, uh, after first leaving King, and uh, um, uh, you know, suddenly it was a it was a it was a global hit. Uh, he I remember one of the things also helping him with like he had seven hundred PayPal thought he was doing fraud because he was making so much money. <laughs> uh, um, and and uh, and and the thing is, just you know, on, on it's so binary within gaming. Like you know, we can sit there and look at it uh, for a long time and. By the by, the time we have any metrics, it's too late to invest because these guys don't need our money at that point. So that's that that explains it in in um, on um, on on the gaming side. But I think also I think generally, you know, it does it, it continues to be cheaper to get uh, to get set up. Um, and 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 finally, I think the last thing is that I fundamentally don't believe you can make money on. On, on later stage investments. Um, the attrition rate, so the failure rate of the startups is approximately the same as when you start early. Uh, and I would rather have more shots on goal um, than, than, uh, uh, than fewer. So it's, and then it's also, for me, it's just a personal preference. Like, I'm, like by the time when you bring in the BCG guys and McKinsey boys to run it, then it's, it's not as fun anymore. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, 
Yeah. Tommy's a McKinsey boy, but he's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought about uh, your oh. views on uh, crowdfunding and all these and venture capitalists. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I hope they put us out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And, and, and like, so when I was in, I, I'm not allowed to invest privately as a partner in a, in a venture fund, or at least we're, we have made that agreement amongst ourselves and with our investors. Um, when I was investing privately, my parents used to piggyback with 100 thousand, fifty thousand, twenty thousand, you know, just a little bit of, of money, but that didn't go into their pension uh, savings, but went into to, uh, um, to doing a, 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 a startup investment. And the fact was that they could piggyback on me, they, but they did not, obviously did not understand what they were investing into. Um, and I think that's the, um, uh, you know, I would love if if Tommy and Thomas Mukdale and Martin and other smart people who, who, who have access to some of these deals also started that and, and started expanding the, 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 the pool through you know, whatever angel this calls syndicates or, 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 or others. Um, and I think the, you know, I, 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 I don't think there's a reason why, um, why there should be so many layers in between the, the that the person with the savings and the, per the and, and the company. I mean, in reality, I'm investing uh, you guys' pension money, um, and and I, you know, you might as well be investing those directly, right? So, are we going to be needed? Of course, we're still going to be needed. I think it's going to be hard to uh, to um, uh, to really uh, get out of a venture, but but. But then there's the then there's the the opportunity to invest. You, you know, actually, I think you the, the crowdfunding expands the pool. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a a, a, a net sum zero game. Um, so yeah, so I think it's I think it's great, and and I'm actually helping about students and also on like formulating uh, uh, policy around it because I, I because I think it's an important topic. So. Um, Okay, if uh, that's it, then uh, thank you so much, Nikolai, for seeing this time. Well, thank you guys all very much. Um, before you leave, um, a couple of announcements. First of all, please hang around afterwards, have some more beers and, and chat. I uh, hope Nikolai will stay around as well. Um, on a different note, there will be another startup grind not too long October in the second. future, October 2nd, with uh, Medellin, actually a former McKinsey girl as well. Um, really exciting from Endomondo, the fitness app. So uh, save that date. Also very important, if you want to be more part of the ecosystem, there's on the First of, first, of September. first of September, the Copenhagen for the win um, town hall. And if you haven't been, you really should check that out. Um, just follow the hashtag on Twitter, um, Copenhagen for the win, um, and come there. So thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you.